Well, following Israeli airstrikes on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon overnight, the acting leader of Hezbollah delivered a televised message today saying the Iranian-backed terrorist group now seeks to retaliate deeper into Israeli territory in order to, quote, make the enemy feel pain, end quote. Meanwhile, the Israeli government has reportedly told the Biden-Harris administration that any response to Tehran's recent missile strike will avoid hitting Iran's nuclear enrichment and their oil production sites. What strategy could the Israeli military be pursuing, or could this be a head fake? Joining me now to discuss the latest from Israel is Daniel Cohen, news director for Real Life Network just outside of Tel Aviv. Daniel, welcome yeah. to Washington Watch. Always great to be with you, Tony, and, uh, and hello to your audience. Hi, everyone. Well, it's good to see you again. I know you were yeah. here uh, in the States for the Prevote Stand Summit, and you're going to be coming back. I'll, I'll go ahead and break the news here on Washington Watch that you're going to be joining uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs and myself with Real Life Network as we do election night coverage uh, on uh, election night. And so, uh, folks, you can tune in either on the Real Life Network app or on the Stand Firm app and get uh, biblical a biblical analysis of the election results. So let's jump right into this, Daniel. What's changed since you got back to uh, to Israel after the Prevost Stand Summit? Well, not a whole lot. There were some things that changed. There had been more uh, attacks from Hezbollah. In fact, Yom Kippur, which was just celebrated on Friday, sundown, just hours into it. And uh, Israel's the only place in the world that celebrates Yom Kippur where everything stops. Businesses stop. Children love it. It's their favorite day of the year because they take to the streets on bicycles. And I was riding uh, with my youngest daughter, and there was a drone that struck literally just two blocks from my house. It was a senior living facility. It was a 99-year-old Holocaust survivor, the drone from Hezbollah. Apparently, they're, they're made with fiber optics now, Tony, and we're hearing that they're the, – Israel said that they were tracking it, but they're way harder to shoot down. And if that's the case, then Israel's going to have to moderate. But from, from Lebanon, I live just outside Tel Aviv, uh, a solid hour and a half, two hours from the Lebanese border. So for a drone to infiltrate and to go that far, it was really a miracle, Tony, I should tell you. They, the building, it's called Bet Juliana. Uh, this this senior living home, and they just had the windows of this facility wrapped with this new kind of an ultraviolet reflecting light, uh, reflecting wrap, excuse me, not light, to reflect the light. And uh, they credited this wrap because when the drone hit, and I've shared on my social media, you can see uh, you can see exactly where it hit. You see a huge hole uh, covered by an Israeli flag in the building, but you can also see that the grass, the the, bla the, the blast, the glass did not explode. It kind of uh, it was it was held in place. And by the way. 99-year-olds, 90-something-year-olds on walkers, obviously with mobility issues. When the sirens sound, we have 90 seconds to two minutes to get to Mamad's, to get to bomb shelters in the basement. So I say it was a, it was a miracle uh, that no one was hurt. Uh, but again, I just think it's God's, God's hand of protection. Yeah, actually, I think when I was in Tel Aviv on my last trip, I stopped there in that uh, senior facility to, uh, to oh. listen to their choir sing yeah. uh, those Holocaust survivors. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about this. According to reports, Israeli Prime Minister mm -hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu and his intelligence leaders have yet to determine a specific response for Iran, but they have told the Biden-Harris administration that they will not target the nuclear facility or oil right. production sites. What do we know? Yeah. Yeah, so that sounds like Prime Minister Netanyahu is moderating, right, on Iran. And uh, why did he do that? Why, why would he do that? Well, that was in order to get the Biden White House to send uh, Israel a very powerful missile defense system. Uh, we're not sure that Netanyahu communicated or, are, you know, we don't know what, what he's shown in terms of what, what he's told the Biden administration. The White House uh, has said, uh, the White House hasn't shown that it can be trusted. Right. And so is it possible that Israel says, OK, uh, President Biden, we will agree not to attack Iran's oil and its nuclear facilities in exchange for this, uh, you know, exchange for this powerful weapons defense system. But a lot of people here in Israel are saying, why, why would Israel broadcast? Why would we say what we will or won't do? And the bigger question then is, is it a precursor to even something larger? Maybe they say, OK, in this initial strike, we won't. But, you know, I ask myself from an Israeli perspective, which is more important? Because we're 20 days, something right from a, just weeks out from an election, and everything has to be viewed through the political lens. 
Which is more important, ridding Iran of its nuclear capabilities if you're Israel, or is it not hurting the Democrats' chances of retaining the White House? The Biden uh, and, and Harris administration, we know what their goal is, but it's pretty obvious that a nuclear Iran is a threat to Israel. They've said they want to wipe Israel off the map. It's a threat to the Middle East, and it's a threat to the entire world. So, you know, to be clear, if we think about it, uh, if Biden wasn't willing to send missile defense to Israel unless Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed not to hit Iran's oil and nuclear sites because of Kamala's chances in the election, if you're standing back and reading the tea leaves and that's what it kind of sounds like, then I say if the United States is supposed to be Israel's strongest ally, is it? If it's putting these conditions on aid? I want to play a clip from earlier today. It's late there in Israel, but yeah. earlier today, uh, Israeli government spokesman David Mincer uh, had this to say. Play clip number one, please. Did you hear that, Daniel? I'm sorry, Tony. I actually didn't hear any of okay. that. So if you can, if you could just tell me what he oh, said, oh. And I can respond. Okay, we're going to play that again. Okay. 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 Uh, of course, uh, we listen to the opinions of the United States, but in the ultimate analysis, we'll make our own final decisions based exactly. on our own national interests. That's always been the case. It's the case uh, with any country which takes the security of its citizens uh, safely, and that continues to be the case now. That sounds more like uh, Israel than the Washington Post uh, anonymous sources. Right. Yes, exactly, Tony. And by the way, shouldn't Israel be concerned about, about Israel and not placating and not worrying about meddling or, you know, Israel's aware, Prime Minister Netanyahu is aware that there's an, an election just days from now, but uh, Israel has to do what's right for Israel. By the way, speaking of, it's not just the United States, the UN, Tony, the UN is making it more difficult for Israel to defeat Hezbollah in Lebanon. Have you, and, and I know your, your audience is up on this, but you know, they, they've been positioning their own, they're calling their, their peacekeeping forces in southern Lebanon, but they've been putting them in harm's way, where Israel is trying to operate and essentially think like human shields. And on Sunday, Prime Minister Netanyahu lost it. He told the Secretary General of the UN, remove the UNIFIL forces. This is exactly where the IDF is operating. Uh, the Israeli military found a Hezbollah com a compound. It was stocked with weapons. It was motorcycles. It, this was underneath a home in a Lebanese border village, it, right, right on the Israel border. And there were, there were terrorists there who were planning, this is the Radwan unit, they were planning a major attack on Israel, Israel believes. Uh, Defense Force spokesman, his name is uh, the Rear Admiral, Chief Spokesman Daniel Hagari. And he showed this video, they showed the bunker just miles from the Israeli border. And there, uh, they had uh, motorcycles, they had weapons, there was ammo, it was strewn across beds inside this underground facility. One of the walls had a large portrait of former, I emphasize former, Hezbollah commander Hassan Nasrallah, who was killed in an airstrike, uh, you know, recently by Israel. That uh, amazing, that amazing airstrike and the way that that was orchestrated. So Israel very much has to take care of its own self and its own business. Unfortunately, I believe, cannot completely trust the United States or the UN to be looking out for it right now. This is very similar to what we saw in Gaza, where UNRWA, the United yes. Nations Relief Organization that uh, is operating down there was a shield for Hamas. In fact, we know that there right. were people working for Hamas that were on the payroll of, of UNRWA. The, the, the UN is not only not helpful, but it appears to be clearly aiding the other side, the enemies of Israel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. You know, uh, Israel is able to ping. This is why Hezbollah, they, this is why they don't want to carry cell phones. Israel can track the technology. The defense, the Mossad, they're, they're incredible. But Israel ran, uh, they did a cell phone ping from October 7th, and they found around a dozen UNRWA employees infiltrated and helped carry out the October 7th attack. Think about that, everybody. What Tony was just saying, UNRWA, these are, these are people that are in place to try to help uh, with, with aid, to try to help get food, water, flour, 
medicine, the necessities, and they, the, the UN organization that, by the way, the United States funds more than any other nation in the world. It's, in, it's to the tune of billions, and I don't, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. But they were the ones, uh, but the Israel tracked cell phones from at least 12, a dozen of them who, who infiltrated and were carrying out the October 7th violent, vicious, grotesque attack against, against women, children, babies. You, you, you know what happened. So yeah, that is, uh, that's grotesque. Tony, that is horrendous. It's awful. I mean, there's, there's not a word strong enough. And again, and so Israel's accused of genocide. <laughs> Israel, which was violently attacked, it makes up four-tenths of one percent of the Middle East. Did you know that? Israel is four-tenths of one percent of the Middle East, has never attacked any of its Arab neighbors, has only responded. And when Israel takes out Hassan Nasrallah and all the henchmen beneath him in Hezbollah and these Hamas commanders, how do the terrorists respond? They respond by launching missiles and drones to try to kill Israeli civilians. I want to ask you this question based upon something you said a moment ago. You know, we've got mm -hmm. the, the elections here in the United States. That could dramatically shift the landscape in terms of the geopolitical landscape for Israel to respond to the yeah. threats, primarily that threat from Iran, but also deal with yeah. Hezbollah. The, the Democratic Party, as t timid and unreliable as they are, are probably more supportive right now because they're going into an election. Is this not the time for Israel to deal with their enemies? Well, I believe it is, Tony, but, you know, I'm not the one making the decisions. And, uh, it, and, a, and a strike on the nuclear facilities uh, of Iran now seems like the moment. It seems like there's never been a better moment. I mean, and Israel would have every... You know, are they all options on the table after uh, at a direct strike uh, earlier this year in April and at a direct direct launch a few uh, just a few weeks ago. All right. So now would be the moment, uh, I, I believe, to do that. But it's it's everything is calculated at the moment, by the way. You know, the uh, the Biden administration has has been saying privately to Iran that any assassination attempt. This is something that a lot of people have been talking about as well against President Trump would be considered an act of war. And when I heard that, I said to myself, why are they communicating that privately? Say it publicly. You know, President Trump has already said the United States should blow Iran's largest cities to smithereens if anything were to happen to him. It, they should be saying publicly right now, if you attack uh, not even just President Trump, Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, there's a contract out, John Bolton. You know, Iran still wants revenge against President Trump for the, uh, two th that 2000 drone strike that killed uh, Qasem Soleimani. And Iran has been targeting. We know that there are cells in the United States. There were two assassination attempts thwarted. July 12th, there was a Pakistani uh, a national, guy, I believe it was Asif Merchant, uh, a 46-year-old, and he was detained by authorities. Uh, and then also, of course, there was the uh, a, a, a attempted assassination attempt, recalling that in West Palm Beach. It was thwarted early. This guy with the AK-47 at the golf course. But Iran hasn't made any secret its desire for retribution uh, and Khomeini, has, uh, you know, they put together this video simulating a drone attack at Mar-a-Lago. Do you remember this? This was right. not long ago. Right. I wish President Biden and I wish our leaders would say, Democrat, Republican, Iran, if you if you so much as look at us the wrong, if you look at any leader here the wrong way, we will take. But that forceful language just doesn't come. It's all about placating and it's all about not escalating, especially days before uh, a game changing election for our country. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. That should be communicated very clearly to any of our enemies that would assassinate one of our, our, our leaders. Uh, yep. Before we wrap up here, Daniel Cohen, um, yeah. some yeah. good news, some uh, good news coming out of uh, Israel today is they recognize kind of their, their, their top allies, those who stand with Israel in a time when we yeah. see what's happening on college campuses over here and we see the ambivalence of some of our leaders. Uh, Israel takes note of who's standing with them. You better believe it. The number one friend of Israel, and this is something they've been doing uh, for, I don't know how long, but it's been a few years now that I've been monitoring. But just today, uh, Israel recognized Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, and the organization that he's president of, that he leads Samaritan's Purse, the Good Samaritan. I mean, evangelicals, Christians, we have an opportunity right now to show the love of Jesus, of Yeshua, to the, to the people here in Israel and Jewish people around the world. But just, just a few weeks ago, I went to the Gaza border uh, for the Real Life Network, and I got to walk and talk and interview Franklin Graham, where they were dedicating two armored ambulances. And while he was there, they said, 
uh, for the people living on the Gaza border community that they would they would dedicate 20, they would do more. They were going to bring 20 more armored ambulances. And he even made a point. He said, think about, you know, you people here have looked evil in the face. You saw it on October 7th. And I wish we didn't have to have armored ambulances. But on October 7th, Hamas told the terrorists who were infiltrating one of their commands was to take out, to destroy ambulances and to kill paramedics, to kill first responders. Why? So that they couldn't treat the wounded and that wow. they couldn't treat the injured. And so the acknowledgement for Franklin Graham was wonderful. Mike Pompeo came in second. Mike Pompeo was number one last year. Uh, and so there's, there's a long list. I won't go through them all, but kudos. I think the world of Sissy Graham Lynch, Franklin Graham, uh, and Samaritan's Purse, and all these organizations that are really stepping, stepping up right now in Israel's time of need. All right, Daniel Cohen, we're going to have to leave it there for tonight, but we look forward to seeing you on election night as we uh, have election coast night. Coast to coverage. coast election coverage, Tony. We'll see you. That's right.